Welcome to the 16th episode of Stefan Frank's Photobook Show. For those of you who are new to the series, um, in the series, Stefan looks at recent and not so recent photo book related uh, books that you might or might not know about. And usually Stefan presents books by a, a variety of artists um, in his show, but today he will only show one single book. Um, it's called Monument by Trent Park. And um, I'm Anya from Strula Media Live, and we offer live online photography classes. And I want to thank you for joining today. I want to briefly tell you about some upcoming classes. Um, other summer classes uh, will be taught by Nestor Perez Molier, who is based in the Bronx, Anita Pusha Serra, who is in Argentina, Carlos de la Sancha, who is in Brooklyn, I think, somewhere in New York. I don't remember if it's Brooklyn, Queens, or Manhattan or the Bronx. Uh, and then Kai McBride will also teach a summer class too, actually. Uh, and he is based in Santa Fe. So that's about our classes. Um, and if you have questions for Stefan, you can just unmute and ask, or you can put them into the chat. Uh, today's talk will be about an hour long. And Stefan, I want to thank you for yet another episode of your photo book show. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you so much, Anya, for having me again. And thank you all so much for showing up here. So it's really a pleasure to, to see you all here. Um, yeah, as um, Anya already told you, so this one, uh, this episode will be a little bit different. So usually I, I look at a couple of photo, uh, photo books and try to find some, some common topics between them. Um, today we will only look at this one which is uh, exactly what it says, Monument, a big, thick book by an Australian photographer, uh, Trent Park, uh, which uh, moved me a lot when I got it. Uh, it came out last year. Uh, the first edition was published in, in, in autumn. I think it was sold out in a couple of hours. So after seven hours, it was already sold out. Um, because it was, uh, it is a collection book of 40 years of photography by Trent Park. Yeah, um, as I said, Trent Park, he was born in, in 71 in uh, Newcastle, New South Wales in Australia. I do not know if you've ever been to Australia. I had the, the immense pleasure to being there one time and I, it is certainly one of the most strangest places that I've ever been. So... If you look at this map, uh, you see the uh, the the edges of Australia. Um, these are the only places in Australia that are somewhat densely populated, uh, which is exactly what brought uh, England to the idea that the the whole of Australia is uninhabited. Uh, this is the reason why they colonized it, and this is also the reason why a lot of these towns that you see here have these very British names, uh, like New Newcastle in New South Wales. Um, of course, as we all know today, um, Australia was very far from not being inhabited. Uh, the center of Australia is um, inhabited by, uh, is one of the places of the world that has been continuously uh, inhabited for probably the, the longest time ever on, a, um, on Earth. Um, as I said, born in 71, New South Wales, he started picture started taking pictures very early. Uh, when he was 12, he used this uh, the, the camera that you see in the upper right, the uh, Pentax Spotmatic that he got from his mother. Uh, unfortunately, his mother died very early uh, in uh, a year later from an asthma attack. And this, these two incidences, so the, the early death of his mother and this early encounter with a camera, that was something that, that shaped him um, a lot. Uh, he started working as a photojournalist in Australia. And uh, strangely enough, he was the first full, he became the first full member of Magnum from uh, Australia. Uh, he has been a, a Magnum member since 2007. Um, 
he has been doing a lot of uh, a lot of photo books. So the first one was Dream Life, our uh, first photo book that which was also about Australia. Um, he works with uh, with photograph, but he also works with with text or with video. Um, he did a major exhibition, The Black Rose, which is a uh, which was a beautiful exhibition at that time. He did this in, in 2015. Um, he has been uh, he has been a user of um, a Leica user for pretty much all his life. He's been using a Leica M6 and Elmerit M28, and he's photographing uh, mostly on Ilford FP4, which. I only want to point this out because uh, you can actually find these kinds of information on the internet. Um, and this is somewhat the, the genetic makeup uh, of his photographic work. So he comes from an analog background, he comes from a photojournalistic background, he comes from Australia, and he's um, been a street photographer for all his life. Monument, the, the book that we will be talking about here uh, is came out in 23. Uh, this is basically 40 years of picture taking. So this is not uh, only this is not only photograph that he took recently, but he um, collected a lot of photographs over the course of his life that uh, ended up in this um, ended up in this in this book. This is one quote that I. Um, that I found when I when I was researching for uh, for this for this talk. Um, if you have ever been to Australia, you will find out that it is really a weird place, and this weirdness of the place is something that also that you will also find in the weirdness of the light. Uh, it has a certain special quality to it, and it is very different from. Um, U.S. American light, for example, and very and certainly very different from uh, the light that you find in, in the middle of Europe. Um, his approach to turn the ordinary uh, into magical, this is something that you will see in his, in his pictures. And this is something that you find in, in pictures like this, where he just puts, where he just uses light to turn a pretty ordinary scene, uh, a figure, uh, being caught in the spotlights of a car uh, into something magical. You also see here um, his his other approach to photography. He's a slow photographer. What you see in the background here is that there are stars rotating. So he's using a lot of uh, long exposure photography, um, which turns people into into weird uh, into weird objects like you see here. Um, the book that we will be looking at uh, only contains this. It contains uh, a metal plaque that says Monument by Trent Park and the date of the publishing um, and the publisher. And Stanley Barker is very uh, adamant to point out that when you remove this plaque from the book, there is no text left in the book. So there is nothing in there that gives away what this is actually a uh, what, what the book is actually about. So this leaves you right off the bat with the uh, uh, with the question: This black book of pictures, what is it about? Because there is nothing, uh, no text in there that gives you any hints on that. And let me try um, an approach to answer that. That may be a little bit weird, but it is very special to uh, to his approach and to. Uh, is coming from Australia. Uh, we move us out of the way. Um, what you see here is uh, the Kübler-Ross grief cycle. Uh, Elisabeth Kübler-Ross, she was a, a Swiss uh, psychologist. She uh, researched a lot in, in the US on um, how people, how humans deal with uh, loss on uh, how they deal with their own fatality, with uh, the loss of people that are very close to them, um, how they deal with uh, with fatal catastrophes that happen in their lives. 
the weird thing about humans is that although these fatal things happen to us, somehow in the end, uh, we managed to move on. And her interest was, how does that actually work? So she did a lot of research on that and did a lot of interviews on that and found out that people are going through these kinds of circles of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, to eventually ending up with something that uh, that is acceptance, acceptance of acceptance of their own mortality, acceptance of the mortality of people that are very close to them, acceptance of these uh, catastrophic events. Um, this cycle, this grief cycle, has been um, used to um, talk a lot, talk a lot about. Uh, many different um developments not only for for in the personal life but also in the in the um development of society and it's interesting to look with this grief cycle at climate crisis uh which is something that i think right now is pretty much on the minds of, of pretty much everybody here and Climate crisis is one of these events where we go through these kinds of phases. Um, there is, of course, uh, in the beginning, a lot of denial. Uh, it is not only this extreme denial of climate uh, deniers like this uh, Australian prote protests against a carbon tax that was introduced into Australia in 2011. Uh, you know that from the US, uh, we also know this from, from Germany, there are a lot of climate deniers, but I also know that from myself, when I enter into my car and start the um, start the gasoline engine, uh, I try to deny uh, that this is happening. And the same is when I um, climb the border plane. So there's a lot of denial about this. Uh, the effects of this in my own life too. So there is, of course, a whole lot of bargaining. So one bargaining uh, you see here, this is uh, a photo from the climate conference in 2015. Uh, you see how happy uh, everybody was to achieve at least a little bit of agreement on uh, limiting uh, the rise of the temperature to 1.5 degrees, and thereby trying to limit the uh, limit the effect that this uh, rise in temperature will have on uh, on the planet. Unfortunately, as we all know, uh, uh, this happy moment uh, stayed like that. After that, that did not happen a lot. Um, not a lot in practice. Uh, not a lot in in policies. Um, which eventually led to the situation where we are right now. Currently, uh, top climate scientists are in a little bit of hopelessness cycle. Uh, the current projections uh, go more towards 2.5 or even 3.5 degree, um, degree uh, increase in temperature. And um, this is what the science says, and the science also projects um, fatal catastrophes uh, happening in, in different places on the Earth. Of course, this is just a global rise in temperature. This global rise in temperature is not evenly distributed. Some, of, uh, some countries will be hit more, some countries will be hit less. Um, of course, there is the other thing about climate change. It is one of the drivers of uh, mental disorders, especially depression, uh, and especially in, in young people. It is certainly different uh, for me, where I look at a limited lifespan left. This is different from people that are between 16 and 24. Um, recent surveys here by uh, Done by Nature last year uh, find that this is one of the biggest cause of uh, depression in people bet uh, aged between 16 and 24 because they look at the a lifespan uh, that goes more into 50 or 60 or even 70 years into the future. So they will be impact impacted from climate change much, much more um, than people from my cohort. 
there's also anger. Um, last year, uh, last week even, we had uh, another protest by um, climate, uh, the climate protesters from Letzte Generation, Last Generation, which um, do all kinds of climate protests here in, in Germany. Um, here they glue themselves to uh, a runway to close down the um, the airport in, in Munich. But you probably know uh, of similar events in your um, near you and also in the in the US. There's anger. What I find curious to see is that um, recently there seems to be some kind of acceptance creeping up. And where do I get that from? Um, I usually get this from uh, looking at uh, how the media respond to this. Uh, if you look at the movies that pop up and in recent years, you find a lot of these movies that start with a catastrophe, where the catastrophe is not questioned. It is not, uh, there is no way of preventing the question, uh, the, the catastrophe. It is all about um, dealing with the effects of this catastrophe. I, I only mention a few here. This is Leave the World Behind with uh, Julia Roberts and uh, Ethan Hawke. Um, this is not a super interesting film, but it has some remarkable images in there. So one of the images is an innocent uh, beach scene with this looming uh, ship on the horizon. And this is the situation we are in right now. We see some kind of menacing um, thing on the horizon. But here we come up with, with different explanations what could happen to the ship. So the ship could be uh, moving further away to another harbor. Um, it could stop eventually. Um, we see the scene uh, unfolding, but we eventually see that the ship is marooned and has uh, all the technology on the ship has broken down and it will um, run into the uh, run into the beach there. There's another interesting scene from that where uh, technology is starting to break down and all the Teslas are. Uh, encounter a weird software bug that makes them drive to one spot in uh, on a road and just crash into each other. So again, this is not a super, um, this is sometimes a, a little bit boring film. This is a questionable film, but has some kinds of interesting pictures in it. And it has this topic that there is a catastrophe that cannot be prevented. It just has already happened. Another one of these movies is Don't Look Up. I don't know if you know that, if you've seen that with Leonardo DiCaprio, it was Jennifer Lawrence, um, which is about the impact of, um, of a meteorite, uh, a meteorite big enough to destroy all life on Earth. And uh, Leonardo DiCaprio plays um, a scientist who tries to warn people against this event. Uh, and they even... Uh, try to come up with a plan to to stop the the meteorite, but uh, eventually they fail in that. Uh, there is, of course, uh, so this is the situation. Earth is being approached by a meteor storm. Uh, there is fantastic uh, performance by Meryl Streep as a Donald Trump lookalike. Uh, fantastic performance by her. Uh, eventually, they launch uh, a rocket into space, but this just fizzles out and does nothing at all. And uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, instead of stopping that, uh, the best he can do is become a, a great podcast star in this uh, in this series. And uh, the film ends on this scene where people are just awaiting, waiting for the impact of the uh, of the meteorite. And this is a new development. Uh, I don't know if you remember this one. This is from uh, 1998. This is Armageddon, same scenario, meteorite crashing into Earth. But here we get uh, all the usual topics of catastrophe films, uh, the hero, uh, the sacrifice, and the rocket that eventually explodes 
uh, the, the meteorite and Earth will be saved. So same topic, different outcome. I also want to mention here Dune. I don't think that it is purely coincidental that it is at this point in time. Dune is interesting because if you come to see of it, it plays on a, a planet that is completely uh, that is completely a desert. So there's no life except these sandworms on there, um, and it has an interesting take because it is not a catastrophe movie. It is a movie about a very very long cycle of time and how people deal with these long cycles of time that uh, exceeds their own lifespan. Um, books have also been written about this. This is uh, Living in the End Times from Slavoj Žižek, uh, already written in, in 2010. He identifies four uh, of the apocalypse here. The, the one is the, the climate crisis, uh, the other is a crisis of um, increasing um, differences in income on the world and then um, differences in wealth distribution that endangers uh, the political stability of the whole earth. Uh, next one is bioengineering. This is uh, the other crisis that we just had with, with COVID. So that was kind of a prophetic move from him. From him. So he is describing some kind of a, a poly crisis, uh, multiple crises that come together and threaten the way we we live today. Um, sometimes this end of the world um, even makes it into the title, um, but I want to point out this: the title of this, this is uh, "Hyper Objects" by Timothy Morton. Uh, it has philosophy and ecology after the end of the world. And this is an interesting title to, to look at because uh, the end of the world for Timothy Morton does not mean the end of life. Uh, it only means that the world we will, the planet we will inhabit and our understanding of the, the planet we will inhabit will drastically change and will have to drastically change. Um, even after the end of the world, Timothy Morton continued uh, writing books. Um, you should ask him why, but this is actually a more positive book and a more positive spin, and it develops different ways on how to conceptualize this, this end of the world and uh, what is wrong with the concept that we currently have of the world. This is very bleak. Uh, but I rem want to remind you of one of the uh, another bleak time that was the Dark Ages, uh, the the Middle Ages. This is a picture from by Hieronymus Bosch in 1516. In contrast to what we um, how we conceptualize the Middle Age today as the Dark Age, uh, the age of uh, the past that was plaguing uh, Europe at that time, an endless religious war that was raging on. Uh, the Dark Ages were not only dark, they were also the start of the Enlightenment. So the end of the world of the Middle Age was basically the end of the philosophy that ruled until that time. And if you compare the Middle Age with the ages that, we, uh, that came after that, our whole concept of the world has changed drastically. And when philosophers like Timothy Morton talk about the end of the world, they talk about that, about a drastic change in our concepts of the world. So what, what does this have to do with Trim Park? Of course, it comes from Australia. And as I said, the temperature rise is not evenly distributed. Um, Australia is one of the, the continent that will be hit by this um, um, by this temperature rise the hardest. Uh, they already now have uh, the medium rise from 1.5 degrees. The projection there go more to 4.5 and 5 degrees in, in the upcoming uh, years. And here we are not talking about a long time span of 100 years, but we're more like talking about 20 to 50 years. So 
when you are 16 and 25 there is and you live in Australia there is ample room for for depression right now of course uh, Trent Park being a photojournalist he knows how this plays out it this plays out in Australia with an increasing likelihood of bushfires. This was uh, the Dunroot fire that burned for a couple of months in Australia and devastated um, large parts uh, of the country there. Um, it also devastated one of the most beautiful places on earth, uh, the Barrier Reef. This is, um, the Barrier Reef is hit by uh, mass coral bleaching events. Mass coral bleaching events happen when the uh, water temperature rises above the uh, degrees that uh, the corals can tolerate, and they just die, uh, removing all the the color from these reefs. Uh, this is just a reminder that this is uh, this climate change is not only affecting um, the land; it is also, of course, affecting the sea. Um, Trent Park, this is the reason why I, I get into this. Trent Park knows about this. He did this um, very beautiful picture, uh, this beautiful photo book in 2020, The Crimson Line, where he photographed um, the beauty in which these things play out. So The Crimson Line comes from um, the idea that through climate change and through the change in uh, the density of the air um, that happens by the exhaust of our industries, uh, we will get very, very beautiful uh, sundowns and sunrises. So this is what he started to photograph here. So these, he made these beautiful images of, um, of industry, of exhaust pipes. Um, these beautiful colored clouds where the water in the clouds mingle with the exhaust of the uh, that is coming out of our industry. Um, here, the title of the Crimson Line comes from this uh, cochinelle. This is a tiny little bug that lives on uh, different cacti, and this is used uh, in a lot of these interest industries um, to make the color red. So there, this is our connection. Uh, this is his connection where the industry connects to, to the natural resources we're exploiting here. There's a lot of pictures from, from fossil fuel because fossil fuel, of course, is one of the, the, the drivers of climate change. So he photographed a lot of these very beautiful oil fields here. But again, he's uh, not, uh, he has this, this dark moods in there, but he's also uh, a hopeful guy. So he's a, he says, he, I'm a sci-fi guy. It's fantasy and science fiction, not reality or, or documentary. I like to escape reality. So although his pictures deal with very um, bleak things, uh, his pictures are not. His pictures are always very beautiful. And to understand what a uh, monument is about, uh, I picked up one of the uh, I picked up one of the um, movies that Trent Park has probably, as I did, uh, seen in his use. This is uh, Star Trek Void, uh, Star Trek the Motion Picture, the first Star Trek movie, and I do not know if you've seen it, but it has um, the story of Viger in in the middle, and Viger is. Um, a gigantic um, astrological entity, intelligent entity uh, that the crew of the Star Trek is uh, sets out to uh, find out what it is and what it wants because it is approaching Earth. And as it turns out, Vija is um, has this, it's a really for the time it's a it's a wonderful movie. It has wonderful artwork. It is really, really long. It takes ages to to unfold these uh, this massive structure there. And I also want to remind you that this was from a pre-digital age, so you have a lot of these practical effects there with um, things being built, especially for that. 
And in the end, it also has William Shatner being really young and spry. Uh, and in the end, it turns out that V'ger has a core. And if you do not want to spoiler uh, the film, I suggest you shut your ears for the couple of next minutes because I will spoiler this for you uh, right now. It turns out that V'ger is an abbreviation for Voyager. So the story of the, the movie is that in 1977, a probe was launched to reach the outer depths of space. And we actually still made, uh, it, it's still sending uh, messages from 24.3 billion kilometers. It just sent a message from uh, on the 18th of May. So it's still somewhere out there uh, to explore the universe and send messages back to us. And the story of Star Trek is that this probe was um, was intercepted by um, extraterrestrial be beings and they rebuilt it and sent it back to Earth. And this rebuilding was based on this here. So uh, Voyager contains a golden record, golden record that contains, um, first of all, our solar position, uh, but it also contains images of who we are, of images of what life is on Earth. Um, it is a super ambitious uh, message that was placed on Voyager 1 and 2, uh, a kind of time capsule intended to communicate a story of our world to extraterrestrials. The science behind extraterrestrials is actually sound. Uh, the space is so extremely vast and extremely big that it is more likely that there is life out there than it is uh, than that there is no life out there. So the Voyager message is a phonograph record. It contains music, but it also contains images. Um, this is the music. So it has uh, Brandenburg concertos, but it also contains uh, Johnny B. Good by Chuck Berry and uh, some Gamelan charts, chants from Java. So um, the NASA made sure to be to give a complete example of what we are as humans. It also contains a lot of images. And so, first of all, some of the images are of an informational nature to make sure they get uh, the extraterrestrials get a, some kind of street map uh, for the solar for the solar system to make sure they can find us again. So this is a solar location map. Uh, this is our uh, the DNA, how DNA is constructed, how pretty much every but every life on Earth is constructed. It contains these cute pictures of, of families, how families are constructed. Uh, it again has these wonderful places on Earth. This is Heron Island, uh, a tiny, uh, a tiny island in the middle of the Barrier Reef. Um, that is only inhabited by some scientists and some birds, hence the name. So they wanted to show the extraterrestrials who we are and how beautiful uh, our Earth is. It also contains these pictures of uh, scientists. Uh, they were pretty much ahead of their time, so they try to um, make an emphasis on really giving a diverse image of, uh, of who we are. So there are pictures from uh, from India there. So one pictures the street scene from Kolkata. There's also photography on this. This is uh, Snake River and the Tetons from, from Ansel Adams. And imagine this golden record on its way to space, on their way to extraterrestrial life forms to inform them who we are. And to be more precise, to tell them who we were um, because the time that this probe takes to reach these extraterrestrials, it is very likely that everybody who is on these records, uh, everybody who wrote these texts, um, everybody who made these pictures, the people on the pictures, they will all be dead. So this is a reminder of uh, for extraterrestrials of who we were. And this is what Monument is about. It is a reminder of who we were, or more precise, of who we are. This eventually brings us to this book, which 
yeah, we've got some pretty dramatic lighting here, which is only fitting here. And this is where all this, um, from this golden record, this is where all the iconography here on this in this book comes from. Here you find the um, the solar map again. You find the uh, you find the Morse codes in which um, that are inscribed on this on this golden record here. And here you find this this plaque here that I already mentioned. We have to get out of the dramatic light here to make sure you can see this a little bit better here. Um, this is the plaque that I mentioned. It's a little metal plaque. This is something that probably should go onto a probe that you sent into space. And this is a book that he made out of this. Um, and just fittingly, as he already said, he's a sci-fi guy. So he uh, starts with pictures from space. Um, so this is the way that he introduces picking up on this idea of the the golden record of going into space. And this is where this has to go. But when you approach this picture closer, you see these kinds of structures here forming and you find out that this is not actually stars, but these are uh, little moss that fly around a light source here. So, these are moss that are circulating around a light source. And uh, when the light hits them, they just light up. And this is what he photographed. And then he goes on to, yeah, aren't we just like that? So these are these, uh, these are we who travel to where we, wherever we want to go and whatever draws us to this. So this, the visual similarity goes over into a, philosophical similarity. So when he starts interspersing these kinds of images with each other, he always goes back to space. So to the idea that how endangered we are, how embedded we are into this, uh, into this, remember that, into this earth that we all live on. So this is why all these kinds of um, weather symbols pop up. Um, and this is one of the the pictures that already give away what this is about and why I went into this into this idea of the Kubler Ross grief cycle. Um, eternity is a wish. It's uh, something that we wish for love to be eternal. Um, but of course, nothing lasts forever. So. He brings this up right from the bat. Um, Trent Park is, at its heart, he's a street photographer. So he has been photographing for 40 years on the street and he has been looking for these light effects, for this how light is reflected, how it forms, uh, how it forms images. So this is what you see here. Um, interesting enough, we, we just had what we call in, in Germany, we had uh, Pfingsten, which is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Anja, it is uh, Witzan, is that right? In English? I do not know. I do not know what the translation is. I have to Google it. We, we just had this. So this is the other pillar of this. A lot of this uh, in this image, uh, in this book, has a very religious feel to that. It doesn't necessarily be Christian religion. It is just a religious feeling. This is why things like eternity and Jesus, and here the doves that represent peace, love, and the Holy Ghost. This is why I came up with Pfingsten and Whitsun. And in between, there's us. So we, we go to work, we take the ferry, um, we travel, we commute, uh, we get caught in these, uh, in these exhausts, uh, we get caught in, this, in these lights here. Um, he has this directed images, these images where people look at one star, the sun, but basically people are looking at the stars. So this is our connection to uh, to the star scene.
again, this it, it's always about these connections, how light plays on different things, how it uh, fixes, fixates moth or people or stars. And the other topic that runs through this is our precious starship that we are sailing through the universe, the Earth here. This is why this appears here all the time. The symbolism here is sometimes a little bit heavy handed. He makes sure to get this to get this clear, to get his message, uh, to get his message across. This is um, this is one pillar of the book, but the other pillar of the book is just the the humanness of the people. So this, these moments that he catches up here. Pentecote, thank you. So these human moments, these people that are standing here on the street and they get picked up by light, just as the mosque get picked up by light. And he has this, these tiny moments in here that he just picks up. Just remember, uh, street photography is super hard, but he's been doing this for 40 years now. So he takes these kinds of tableaus. So this is this is where these fantastic pictures of him start. This very directed lie that you get probably only get in this way in, in Australia here. But again, here, here is um, another one of these pictures where somebody gets picked up by light, just pop, she just pops out of the images. And it looks like a religious symbol, but a, basically it's just a sales, uh, a sales poster that she's um, carrying around here. But this is the strength of this image, the, these portraits, these street portraits, uh, these moments when people get caught and get caught up in light. These observations here where you have a very ridiculous scene, like someone posing here. But the shadow here uh, reminds us again, brings us back to this to this Jesus image, to this praying images. It almost looks like uh, the Jesus on top of uh, the mountain of Rio de Janeiro. So it starts from something which is ridic almost ridiculous, a ridiculous scene, but quickly devolves into something which is has a very almost religious feel to it. And what a fantastic, what a fantastic moment that he caught here. What a what a situation here. This is a person that is sitting on the street with a uh, with a sign that says she needs money to for an operation to cure her from her blindness. Um, he has been a photographer for forty years, so a lot of these pictures um, play on this idea of. Um, play with this idea of photography, of looking. So this is why he strongly identifies with people that are despaired with looking, the people that are looking into the light and are blinded, or people that are just blind here. Again, super strong images. So. Here, his Australianness comes out um, so one aspect is space, the scale of space, very tiny things like a moss, uh, very large things like how far the Voyager is already into space. And the other thing is about time. And um, Aborigines, uh, the Aboriginal culture has a different way of approaching time. They don't have a linear way of approaching time. So it is very important to for him to to make sure that these people are represented here in this in this image somewhere. He references there are some pictures here that reference directly reference a title like this picture of a monument inside the book monument.
So he is a storyteller. He is transforming light into stories. But again, here is another person that looks into the, that is blinded by the light, looks into the sun. More persons looking up. Looking up, looking up is our connection to the universe. This is so where are they looking at? They are looking at this here. They're looking back to the beginning of the book. And this is where it comes back. So one of these things of acceptance, one of these things in that are also talked about by Timothy Morton is the idea of dark ecology. Um, there is some kind of drivenness. So we always imagine that we can just do whatever we want. Here he places this uh, us uh, humanity into a ecological context where we are um, not driven by our will, but we are also driven by circumstance. We are driven by our nature. And this is the other symbolism of the moss here. They can't help but circle around the light. There are obvious references in here. So one of the references is it. I tip my hat to, to Brad Feuerham. We wrote a brilliant article on American Suburb X. You can check this out. Eventually he was mentioning a lot of uh, Japanese photographers that uh, because of the blurriness here, especially uh, mentioned Kikuchi Kawada, who made a book about Hiroshima, but he also made this book about the last cosmology. So he's also one of these Japanese photographers who look into space. And here we are almost in the middle of this. And this is one of the most striking images here. So this is actually a double spread that again opens up to this moss. And it has this weird two things. So the one is uh, this blast of light here. And the other thing is the first appearance of the falling man. And again, Brett Feuerhelm mentioned here that the falling man after 9-11 always references this picture by Richard Drew. So this is falling man from, from Richard Drew. This is a picture of somebody jumping off um, the uh, the World Trade Center after it was after the planes crashed in here. So I would also mention another reference here, uh, vertical. So this idea of falling, of not being in full control of where you go. This is something that always comes up in dreams. You fall, and you cannot help but falling. So. I would also mention vertigo here. These blasts of light also reference um, the, the age we're in. So most scientists um, place the beginning of our age, the Anthropocene, the, the age when um, the face of the Earth is governed by the impact of humans on it. Uh, they place it on this, uh, on an exact moment. This is the first geological um, epoch that is made by humans, or that has his name by humans. Uh, and they place it on exactly on the, on the day of the Trinity test, uh, when the first uh, atomic bomb was, um, the first atomic bomb test was, was performed. So these two connections that we are not absolutely in control of what happens to us. This feeling of uh, falling that we're currently in. This is pointed, uh, this is connected to the, the Anthropocene, the idea that we make how the planet looks like. And this recently got picked up by a lot of these um, by a lot of these movies here. This is this uh, picture from Oppenheimer, which came out last year. I want to want already also want to mention David Lynch, Twin Peaks, who also brought this up just a couple of years ago. And of course, Kikuchi Kawada, he has seen it with his own eyes because he was one of the first photojournalists at the scene in, in Hiroshima. So 
this is the age of the Anthropocene, and this is what this book is about. And again, this is not only this is not only bleak. So one of the, the other pictures from um, from Oppenheimer uh, are these. So this is the dawn of quantum physics. This is a different understanding of how the world is constructed. Quantum physics has massively re revolutionized how we perceive the world. And it's no coincidence that he always connects it back with these kinds of images that look like partic uh, images from a particle accelerator. But it's just moss circulating around the framework. And this just goes on here and increases in intensity until it becomes either the light from the sun or the light from an atomic blast. But he never leaves Australia and the personal ideas of this. This is, again, a reflection from the sun, but it looks like there is a gigantic explosion in the middle of um, in the middle of Melbourne here, uh, in the middle of Sydney here. And suddenly here, when you when you are past this point, this looks different. These, these scenes start to look different. They look like people are shielding their eyes from uh, the artificial light of an atomic blast. But these shielding scenes, they appear all over the all over the images here. I have to speed my up a little. Let me pause just on this. So because this is the other aspect of this book, it's just fantastic photography. I just try to figure out how he did this. So as I mentioned in, in the beginning, he has this knack for long, for long uh, exposure. So this is a long exposure where you see uh, he had the shutter open during uh, a bus uh, crossing from left to right. So he photographs the bus, but he leaves the shutter open to fo also photograph the people behind that. And then he photographs the people that are in front of the light. These are these shadows that you see here. They are on the opposite side of the bus station. They are on the opposite side of the road, though their shadow falls onto the bus when it crosses the street. So it's a brilliantly constructed constructed image. Um, you can figure out um, how this is done, but it never gets old. It's just a fantastic image. But again, you see here, this is, it's a different scales. It's different times, people moving in different speeds, people just standing there and looking, looking at the photograph or looking at the light from the photograph. Um, his ancestors, so he was raised in the, he, he came up in the in the 70s, 80s, 90s. So in Australia, there was not, uh, that was, a, his education comes from a pre-internet time. So he has a lot of references to, uh, the only photographic references he knew at that point were to classic street photographers like Vinogrand, William Klein. And this is where his pictures come from. This could be, a typical um, Gary Winogrand shot, where uh, in Winogrand shots you have all these people that are just looking at the camera because Winogrand was just a just a um, curious guy to be on the street with his camera, and this is where these looks come from. But again, every you can endlessly look at these single pictures here. I will flip over some of this. Here again, there are the references to the golden record and to our position in space. Here we are, exactly here. So if you're an extraterrestrial, you know how to find us. And it just goes on with these images. Here again, we have the these images of the falling man, of the losing control. They pop up time and time again here. I will skip a little ahead because we are already running short on time here. Towards the end here, this ideas of everything being engulfed in light and being um, 
solved in light, this gets increased. So the um, increasing, uh, he, he enlarges his images. So he goes closer in scale to the silver that you see on the film. So when you see something like this here, these spots here, we are almost at the level, at the molecular level of the film here. And he ties this molecular level, so this scale back again to this, to the moss, to the scale of the moss, to the scale of the human being, and then again to the scale of the solar system and to space. And this book forms some kind of movement towards the end. So it gets dissolved in, in light here. The trajectories become more pronounced here. The figures get darker, they get more distorted. He enlarges his pictures more. He picks them out more. He is more precise in that on the one hand in the, in the gestures, but in the enlargement process, distorts the people. They get harder to, to find, to look at. And here we are closing down on the level of the silver on the film. And it's you can almost feel like everything is vanishing into dust. It's vanishing into space dust. And this is what happens to the people here. And it gets to the point where we can hardly see what is going on in the room. And of course, he ends where he started. In a picture of space. And this is Trent Park Monument. Yeah, the sun helped to make it more performative, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Wow, that was quite a ride. Oh my goodness, this is like a science fiction movie we just watched. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said he's a, he's a sci-fi guy, so I just yeah. thought I'd just, I'd just roll with it. I thought the ending was amazing. I mean, it was just really, it reminded me even of um, La Chute, the Third World War. Yeah, by Chris yeah. Marker with yeah, these yeah. close-ups and abstract faces and all of that. Uh, are there any questions from anybody? Yeah, right. But Legendary is a good point because it's very, it's a very cinematic book. So it has all these movie references in there. Yeah, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, I don't hear you. Lisa, I don't hear you for some reason. Are you sure the audio is on on your computer? You are now muted. Oh, I was, I still sorry, I was just down. nodding. Very cinematic. Oh, yeah. No, how did you get a, you get a talking, copy of the book? I, I was talking to the other Lisa. Sorry, Lisa. That's we have okay. two Lisa's here today. Okay. Stefan, how did you get a copy of the book? That's a good question. Yeah, that is one of the downsides of the book. Uh, the books, the food books getting, are getting increasingly expensive. So there is, this is the third edition. So the, it comes in uh, at 85 euros and it comes with, I don't know, 15 or 17 euros of postage and packing it. I still, it can still be ordered with Stanley Barker because they are running the third edition right now. So you have the I third can edition. Lisa, oh. I can hear you now. Wonderful. Good. Sorry about that. Please. I just wanted to know how the, how the book keeps changing. Because I know this is edition is is different than the other ones, and or or maybe it's the a newer edition that's different. But what did he add or subtract or? Um, as far as I have as as far as I have seen, because I don't have the first edition, because I was not lucky enough to slide into the seven hour window of the first edition. Yeah. Um, 
but what I've heard is that they have added uh, more images. So the, the initial edition was a little bit lighter. Um, I have actually no idea which images he added. I can only assume that they ended that they added uh, something to make this flow more fluid because it has a really good flow now with these interspersed moss images that you see everywhere. So and you, it has these cinematic sequences where you have two or three or four images coming next to each other. And this is something where I think, okay, maybe this is where they added some stuff. And this flow is, is not only with the moss patches, but I showed you this in the end. So this is really, you really can feel it. You, I don't know if you've seen, uh, there is Marvel's Endgame where you have people just vanish into dust with a snap of a finger. And this feels like that. So people are just vanishing into thin air. They, they just go back to space dust, where, where we all come from. Um, any Anybody else? OK, well, we are over time. Uh, Alan. I, I just want to simply say my wife has been watching dystopian movies for the last three or four weeks, and I think I'm losing her. But uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is not a great help here. So I'll, come, I'll come back one night and she'll be dust, you know, a little <laughs> mound of uh, dust. Please, but get, get her into get her into Timothy Morton. This is the reason why I mentioned Timothy Morton. Um, he is he is bleak on very bleak on one side, it's talking about how we may already be at the tail end of that. And there is, even if we think we can stop it, there's actually no way of stopping that because these events have a different time scale. But then make her look Dune. Dune talks about this time scale. It has a time scale of a couple of thousand years of dynasties. And this is what humanity can be. And Timothy Morton talks about these things too and talk about um, that just our conception of the world has to change. This is the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It's just the end of this concept of the world that we're having right now. So maybe this is helpful for her. I don't know if it gets her back. <laughs> I'd like her to see a video of, of your, your talk, if that's OK. If you, you know we'll, we'll, uh, we'll add it to the YouTube channel. Yeah, we'll add it to the YouTube channel. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for joining today. I hope that many of you will come to Stefan's mini workshop tomorrow. Um, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for this great photo book show. I just want to mention the workshop will be much, much less philosophical and much, much more practical. So <laughs> that's right. No, no dystopians there. So just plain. <laughs> this is how to get things done. <laughs> <laughs>